is that the AEA is also working on the question of, uh, of, uh, of the, I mean, so all these uh, uh, ideas about the bed for me have been an obsession for quite a long time. But because we have been uh, actually through such an incredible period in terms of COVID, I wanted to start precisely with a reflection on the question of the bed, if you want, in the age of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, uh, because the bed in general is this uh, kind of piece of equipment that normally is hidden from public uh, view, despite the fact that here I am giving a lecture <laughs> in bed, it's usually private, right? Uh, no, and, and so all of a sudden, uh, they appear everywhere in the pages of the uh, front pages of, uh, of newspapers. Uh, to Zoom meetings. I never seen the beds of my colleagues and all of a sudden you are in a faculty meeting and you realize someone is sitting on the bed or you see a bed in the background. So all of a sudden the bed was every, everywhere, right? And first, uh, actually in terms of COVID was of course, as you remember very well, the urgent call for, for beds in the early days of the pandemic, of hospital beds, of course. Beds then overflow in every possible space in hospitals, filling every every corridor, every uh, what we used to, to call waiting rooms, because nobody could be waiting um, anymore. Any room of any size became a room for, for beds. And, and the whole space, space of the hospital all of a sudden was taken over uh, by, by this bed. Then the beds started to, to make new spaces, as you know, in tents, in, in, in gymnasia, in parks, in convention centers, like this one in Madrid. It's a convention center in Madrid that was turned into a field uh, hospital for 5,000 beds in the space of uh, a few days. Uh, uh, and a lot, a lot of people uh, that I know in Madrid uh, either were there or died there, right? So it is, it, it is an incredible spaces, these haunting images of, of cavernous spaces, not just uh, um, in Madrid, but uh, in Belgrade or in the Javis Center, uh, in New York, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of, um, of beds on a grid, each one with their oxygen tank and a domestic lamp in the case of the, of the, of the Javis Center in New York, like waiting uh, beds, beds also in parks, like uh, outside in Central Park, outside Mount Sinai uh, hospitals. So everywhere, uh, uh, this, uh, base, this bed. And the question dominating the bed was how many beds, right? And how many beds are occupied? And how many people survive uh, uh, the bed? And then there was the incredible definition, uh, because there was no space anywhere, that any bed with a ventilator was an EUC intensive care unit, ECU uh, unit, right? So in fact, you can say uh, that the bed itself was the room, was the architecture, because every bed defined uh, uh, aspects. And this is also important to remember that it's not the first time that we were there. We were all shocked by the situation, but it's actually, if you go back historically, not the first time that beds were occupying this, uh, improvised spaces, these cavernous spaces. Think about the beds uh, during the 1918 flu uh, in the United Sp Space, the so-called Spanish flu that actually originated in Kansas, by the way. <laughs> you know the story? They call it the Spanish flu because Spain didn't enter the First World War and it was the only country that didn't have um, this restriction that you couldn't say anything negative in the press, right? So all the countries were like, you couldn't say that a flu was going around. Right? The, the, the flu originated in the United States, but nobody was saying anything. The flu was going uh, all over Europe, but nobody could say anything in Spain. And then we were not at war. So they start writing, you know, there's a strange flu going around. All of a sudden, it's called the Spanish flu. And to this day, this is the crazy thing. You know, uh, uh, of course, many people object and correctly uh, to call the COVID as uh, the idiot of Trump be the Chinese flu, right? Because it's so. Uh, but they still, the same people will say the Spanish flu. And you're like, what the fuck? It's not even the Spanish. But anyway, this is the American the flu, if anyway, the 1918 flu, we should say. And, and you can see very, very similar images of this occupation of these uh, beds. Uh, uh, of all this space. But even beds uh, in the street transporting uh, the sick uh, uh, 
were like a portable uh, rooms, uh, some in case uh, in a plastic plastic bubble, reminiscing very much of the 1960s science fiction architecture, these beds on the move that became a site, uh, actually a terrifying site for those of us uh, are living in the street in New York in the early days of, of the pandemic, very little notice is kind of what we were seeing in the street. And also, you won't believe that, but the ambulance were not using the sirens because there were no cars to fight against. So one day, Mark and I were walking down Sullivan Street, which is a narrow street in, in New York, just walking in the street, because we could at least, not like in Spain, that we wouldn't even be able to go for a walk. Anyway, we are walking and I said, there is an ambulance behind us, and it was just slowly going down the street, but they, it wouldn't put the, the sirens because it was just, so you move to the side wall and then you will see this terrifying uh, 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 situations with these medical professionals totally kind of um, brought in protestic, uh, protective uh, gear, like almost like terrestrial uh, astronauts uh, complete with their oxygen uh, tanks. And this portable bed became a, actually a, a link between the domestic bed, of course, and the hospital bed. So there's a vast equality of, of beds, uh, and then a whole landscape of, uh, of beds. And, you know, again, you know, because I'm a historian, I cannot tell myself, right, to think about who, how have we been there before, right? And I could, you know, I found, for example, this uh, image of uh, uh, cholera in Palermo in, in 1835, you know, and I kept thinking about the parallels between this image of these two characters picking up this body in the street, the waiting vehicle, and again, this guy is picking up this uh, sick person in the streets uh, in, in, in New York and, and, and taking it into, into the waiting ambulance. But also it's uh, important to, to realize that these places are not just uh, in the media, as if you want the real facade of this new city, the city of COVID, but they, are, they were also, and, uh, media platforms, Zooming, broadcasting, FaceTiming, bed-to-bed -bed, uh, communication. Think about, about all of those who just uh, communication at all, who's, who's with their uh, loved ones, was on a, on a phone, okay? on a cell, uh, cell phone held by, a, or any other tablet held by, by a nurse. I think about all of those connecting with friends and colleagues from, from there. Think of all the best that you see in the, in the bar, you know, so these devastating images, but also think about all the beds that we saw, as I said before, in the in the um, background of war meetings, socializing, comedy shows, at home music concerts, all these things. So no bed was a secret anymore. No bed is a secret anymore. And the things that this new architecture of the bed, and that's why I call it to the architecture of the bed. It's not a side effect of the pandemic, but it was exposed by, by the pandemic. And once exposed, it, well, it may as well uh, mutate again. And I'm going back to the origins, actually, of my work on the back, which goes back to, 19, to 2012, when completely by chance, I read in the Wall Street Journal that 80%, 80% of young professionals in New York were working from their beds. I said, 80%? 80% of young people are working from their beds, then some, something else is happening, right? Then what, what we call work has changed, then what we call a home, what we call a bed has changed. This is unbelievable. I was completely by chance because I was giving a lecture somewhere in the United States and they always uh, leave the Wall Street Journal in the, they used to, because now they don't in the age of COVID, but they used to be outside your, 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 uh, your room. And as I was going to the airport, I pick up the Wall Street Journal and then the plane is delayed, but they don't let you use the telephone anymore. And to make the story short, I read the whole Wall Street Journal from, <laughs> from the middle. I never have done that. And then in the business section of all places, I found this uh, article that say 80%, 80% of young professionals in New York are working from bed. And that started something uh, that I, you know, that is where I am right now, but I'm telling you, it's not coming from COVID, it comes from this article in 2012, right? So obviously uh, something had, was already happening. The bed has become a new kind of office, if you want. And this, you have to think about 2012, still very much feeling the strong effects of the, of the 2008 uh, uh, crisis with many people, um, 
uh, you know, not, not working anymore in the usual uh, uh, nine to five work in offices. Many people actually were fired, actually were, were let go. And then working in the so-called gig economy and, and, and some of them, I mean, you're talking about New York, of course, many people are sharing apartments and sometimes and most of the time, the only private space that you probably have is your bed, your bedroom. So there is this army of dispersed uh, but interconnected uh, workers uh, that was already uh, operating in 2012 uh, 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 where architects and the rest of us were not uh, 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 thinking that this represented a huge transformation in what we understand the city is, what the city is, and, and that in fact we are living, if you think about it now, which has become completely exacerbated with the pandemic, in obsolete cities. They have expired, like the milk in the in the, in the, in the right? So the separation between the city of work and the city of of uh, of, uh, of living uh, is uh, is not uh, or is not uh, you know half of half of Midtown Manhattan is empty. You know that's that's more than half. I mean during the pandemic, much more than half. But right now, half half of these office buildings are uh, empty. Where of course we have a huge problem of uh, of, uh, of homeless. Uh, 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 people, so a complete need to redesign and to rethink what the city is in this moment. And nevertheless, we have been um, not thinking about this for the longest time because this is not not new. This was already uh, was already there. So, as I say, this was already there. And the question is that the virus has taken this up to a whole new uh, uh, level, and there is no reason to think that we will leave the bed when all of this is over. Now that we have become so much better. Yeah. So much better working in bed, teaching in bed, shopping in bed, lecturing in bed, mm -hmm. socializing in bed with people miles away from our beds. And I mean, the bed used to be the site of this intimate uh, uh, physical contact. And now maybe we we'll have to go out in the street um, in search of such uh, uh, contact. In New York, in the early days of the pandemic, and we were uh, there, we were all told to assume that we were sick. To, to act as if we were sick, as if we were contagious, confined to our apartments, to our beds. So the real epicenter of COVID was not New York City. And then, hello, <laughs> <laughs> as the news, I like that, as the news uh, kept insisting, but the bed, and presumably the sense that we are sick and that we are vectors of disease and a threat to others is still lingering uh, in. But my main point is precisely the, the, the condition for this were already there, that millions of dispersed uh, beds have already taken over from concentrated office uh, building, that network uh, technologies, electronic technologies, have removed any limit to what can happen in bed. And, and the question then for me, as I said, being a historian is how did we get there? And since I cannot just to myself, but how did we get there? I went back to that beautiful test of Walter Benjamin when he talks about the splitting of work and home in the 19th century. And he talks about, uh, he writes it in these terms, and that we believe the private citizen enters the stage of history for the private person, so it's the invention of the private person, right? For the private person, living space becomes for the first time antithetical to the place of work. The former is constituted by the interior and the office is its complement. So, of course, he's talking about uh, industrialization and the uh, uh, arrival of the eight hour, it took a long time, right? But the eight hour uh, shift to work and the radical separation between the home and the office, or so the home and the factory, right? Between rest and work, between night and day. And there's no question that this would have been totally traumatic for that generation, for a generation that work uh, and live in the same place, like the craftsman with the living upstairs and working in the, in the artisan, or, or the farmer working. And all of a sudden, they have to commute long times and adjust to particular schedules. That would have been extremely traumatic. So now complain that, that this is a change for us. That was nothing compared to what it was for that, for that generation. This was a radical. Uh, a transformation. And what is happening now uh, with uh, uh, what we call post industrialization is that it's collapsing uh, work back into the home and further taking it into the bedroom and into the bed itself. So the whole universe, if you want, is now concentrated on this small 
a screen with the bed floating um, in an infinite sea of information. So to lie down is not just to rest anymore, but to move. You are actually active. The bed is a cycle of active. And this involuntary or voluntary, if you want, invalid uh, has no need for their legs, as this uh, advertisement that someone, an artist, Muntada, sent me when I started working on the bed. He was on a plane and he discovered this advertisement, collaborate in bed. Right? Can you believe it? <laughs> so, this is again around the same time, 2012, 2013, when he first gave me to talk ab about this. He said, Look at what I found. He, he read that from an from a actual magazine. These magazines that no longer exist, right? I mean, but they were in the, in the back of, of the plane. Collaborate uh, in, in the. Uh, and of course, a whole new industry is now dedicated to provide contractions to, to facilitate war while lying down, reading, writing, uh, texting, recording, broadcasting, listening, talking, and of course, eating, drinking, sleeping, or making uh, love. Activities that seem to have been turned into work lately. Endless advice is, is, um, is this depends about how to work on your personal relationships, how you usually schedule sex with your partner, because apparently you don't put it in the schedule, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. And sleeping is, of course, hard, hard work for most of us, for the majority of people with millions uh, uh, with the sick psychopharmaceutical uh, industry providing new drugs uh, every year and an army of sleep experts uh, providing advice on how to achieve this apparently ever more elusive goal. No, there are even apps, no? To, I mean, this is also part of the Mahmoud Khaled uh, insomnia, right? Yeah. Insomnia is very much part of our lives and there are apps for that too, right? The calm and all of this which have inspired um, uh, his work. And all of this, all this uh, achieving this, this goal is of course in the name of, of productivity. So everything done in bed has become uh, work. Right, and, and this philosophy is actually already or was already embodied in the figure of Hugh Hefner, the famous um, uh, uh, editor of uh, Playboy magazine, who famously never left uh, his bed, let alone his house. He literally moved his office into his bed in 1916 when he moved into the Playboy mansion in Chicago, and he turned the bed into the epicenter of his global empire and his silk pyjamas into a new kind of business uh, dress. I don't go out of the house at all. I am a contemporary recluse. He's supposed to have told Tom Wolf that came to uh, interview him in the house. And of course, the interview takes place uh, in bed. And, and then he guessed that the last time that he had been out of the bed and out of the mansion had been three and a half months before. And he also guessed that the last two years he may have been out of the house nine times right nine times and of course when he gets out of the house he's not out of the house because he goes from the bed to the outfitted vehicles to the playboy bunny airplane to all this uh, club that he had all over the place so he moves basically into a continuous uh, interior right um playboy turned the place into, into the bed into a workplace already from the mid 1950s on, and you can see all these articles that were in Playboy magazine that inspire millions of people in America to build this uh, uh, this uh, this round uh, beds. I had a student in my class when I was teaching this class on Playboy uh, architecture, and he said, "Well, now I understand the bed that my my father, uh, who separated from, from from my mother in I don't know what year in the 70s, and he built he had this because." people, the readers of Playboy will start asking instructions on how to build this. And at some point, Playboy published the instructions and uh, you know, you could have them built by your carpenter, right? So there are thousands, millions of, of round beds all over America and a cottage industry of round seats and round blankets and round mm -hmm. things to, um, to accommodate this, uh, uh, this, uh, this thing. So it becomes completely uh, uh, sophisticated and outfitted with all kinds of uh, of uh, entertainment. And you look at all the media that is in this uh, in this bed. I mean, he, there was always media, right? But uh, in the early in the early bed is a tele, there's many telephones and, and tape recorders and all of a sudden. But then the whole thing starts increasing, and there are televisions and all kinds of. And he's making the magazine 
in bed, he has all the interviews in bed, all the layouts, so everything is happening uh, in the um, in the bed. But he's not the only one. The bed became uh, the ultimate office at mid-century. Uh, in an interview in the Paris Review in 1957, for example, Truman Capote was asked, what are your, uh, some of your writing habits? Uh, do you use a desk? Do you have a typewriter machine? To which he answered, no, I don't. I'm a completely horizontal author, he says. I cannot even think unless I am uh, lying down. And then he goes on to, to explain how he, he uh, works uh, from the moment he wakes up in uh, lying in bed and he first writes in, in long hand and then uh, in the afternoon he starts putting his typewriter in his, in his, in his knees and starts typing and then goes on to the rest of the day and he doesn't move um, uh, from the bed. And of course another example that may come to mind is the famous uh, Yoko Ono and John Lennon bed in for peace, right? Where they have their honeymoon uh, in their uh, bed in the Hilton uh, Hotel in Amsterdam. And they invited uh, uh, all these media people, all these uh, 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 journalists from uh, magazines and newspapers from all over the world to visit them in their beds at the bed for peace, you know, it's in protest for the Vietnam War. And, and they were there from uh, uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So basically they were treating uh, the bed as an office again, in which they were uh, interviewing uh, and uh, uh, protesting the war uh, from their bed, right? Here they are in their bed, bed peace, here peace. And of course, you know, I mean, I could go into to other questions like the questions of labor. I mean, who is uh, making this bed? Who, what labor makes this uh, staying in bed uh, possible? But to make the, the story short, I just give you this example too from um, the bedding in, in uh, Amsterdam. They went, in, they went into Montreal uh, and to Toronto first and then to, to Montreal where they, uh, they have all these people in their beds like Timothy Larry and all these uh, people on drugs and they uh, 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 also recorded give peace a chance. I mean, it's a fantastic story, but I don't have a lot of time here. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but it's a fantastic story too that I have written uh, about in, uh, in, in another context uh, about this, this uh, Yoko Ono and, and, um, and John Lennon uh, bed in. Uh, for peace, because in fact, in our age, uh, uh, you know, the bed in is, is, is a play on sit in, right? So uh, the street, uh, the bed is taking over from the street, the street in a way, as a site of protest. And it's important too, because it's a play, place of war. We are working for peace, right? But architects, surprisingly enough, also set up bed uh, in, uh, as an office at mid century. This is Richard Neutra, which in his house, not only there are plenty of occasions to lie down. <laughs> But apparently he started working the moment he woke up with uh, very elaborate equipment that enabled him to design, write, or even interview in bed in his house in the, the BBL uh, house in Silver Lake, uh, Los Angeles, included all kinds of equipment. He says two public phones, three communication stations for take, talking to other rooms in the house and the office below. So you would think he's not getting out of bed because it's more efficient not to have to go to the office. The office is just downstairs mm -hmm. and he just cannot be bothered going down downstairs. So he works uh, 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 from bed. Uh, he talks about all these drafting boards and all these systems that he, they are not pictures, unfortunately. Uh, and issues that fall down over the bed and electric lights and a radio gramophone and a bedside that table that contained the, the uh, rolling on casters that held the tape recorder, electric cloth, and the storage um, uh, compartments for the drawings and the writing equipment so that he could, as Neutra put it, and I know all of this because he wrote a letter to his sister about this, he says so that he could, he says to his sister, um, to use every minute from morning to late at night. So again, it's to work more, he doesn't move from the bed, right? And he explains all of this to his uh, sister. In a way, post-war America, uh, uh, to make it short, inaugurated the high performance bed already as the epicenter of productivity, a new form of industrialization that was exported globally and now has become available 
to an international army of dispersed but interconnected uh, producers, a new kind of factory digital walls is constructed by compact electronics and extrapedos for the 24 7 generation that he has. The kind of equ equipment that Hefner envisioned is now expanded for the internet and social media generation, who not only work in bed, but socialize in bed, exercise in bed, read the news in bed, and entertain sexual relationships with people miles away uh, from their bed. The playboy uh, fantasy of the nice girl uh, next door is more likely realized today with someone in another continent than in the same building or, the neighbor or a neighborhood, or a person you may never have seen before and may never see again, and is anybody's guess if she is real or is an electronic uh, uh, construction. As in the film, remember the film Har, mm -hmm. which is a very moving kind of depiction of life in the soft kind of uttering state that is a corollary to our new mobile technologies. The Har in question is an operating system that turns out to be more satisfying <coughs> partner than a person. And the protagonist is lying in bed with her, chanting, arguing, making love, and eventually breaks with uh, her also still in bed. So, uh, now let me just think a little for a moment in this book, little book of 24-7 uh, of Jonathan Crary, a book that argues that late uh, capitalism represents the end of sleep, colonizing every minute of our lives for production and consumption. I really recommend this book. It's really very, very interesting. But if this is, is correct, then the actions of this uh, voluntary recluse are not so voluntary uh, in the end. But what Curry doesn't point out, which I think is really very important in this moment for us, is that the 19th century division between the city of, uh, of rest and the city of war may soon become obsolete if it's not already obsolete, as I was saying uh, before, because not only have our habits and habitats changed with the internet and social media, but predictions about the end of human labor in the wake of new technologies and robotization, predictions that were already made by the way at the end of the 19th century are no longer treated as futuristic. Here you have this, uh, uh, late economists that then even won the, the Nobel Prize and everything, Vasily Leontief, but 35 years ago, already uh, uh, say they replaced forces, didn't they? And, and basically say that the human worker will go the way of the horse, right? And, and nobody pay any attention. But uh, uh, recently, by recently I mean 2016, before the pandemic, the New York Times business section, again, was picking up on this, and reconsidering uh, the end of what they call the human workforce after uh, Leontief. And they write, forces hung, uh, following Leontief, forces hung around in the labor force for quite some time after they were first challenged by modern communication technologies like the telegraph and the railroad, hauling staff and people around farms and cities. But when the internal combustion engine came along, horses as a critical component of the world economy were history. Humans as workforces may also be on the way out. So it may be on the way out. Um, and of course, economists wonder what kind of economic model this reality will lead to from growing inequalities with vast amounts of people uh, unemployed, uh, as if we were not already in, 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 uh, in a moment of incredible inequalities. Two more optimistic uh, uh, accounts uh, that include the large scale redistributing in the form of what we call the universal basic income, which as you know, may, uh, was uh, already considered in a referendum in Switzerland a few years uh, ago and rejected. But the fact that it was put in a referendum in Switzerland, they make us think about it, right? And then when we thought that this was only a Swiss thing, Right? There were experiments everywhere from California to, 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 um, to Finland and even uh, in the United States, which I think would be the last place in, in the world who they think that the universal basic income is an appropriate idea. We have uh, presidential candidates like uh, Andrew Jan, uh, who then became a, a presidential, no, a mayor, uh, a candidate for mayor in New York. And his, uh, his uh, platform was all on the basis of the universal basic uh, um, income. 
the end, this is the incredible thing that where all these people, economists, etc., are thinking about it, architects are not thinking about it. And you think, well, what's wrong with us? Because if you think, because if you think about it historically, it's shocking. Because in the 60s, the end of pale labor and its replacement with some sort of creative uh, leisure was very much envisioned in utopian projects such as the uh, ones of uh, Constance, of Air Studio, Archifilm, Archigram, etc. Here you found the beds of uh, Warren uh, Chalk, the Bathematic, or the Sweet Alone of Mike Webb, etc. etc. So all of these uh, proposals of this period uh, included symptomatically enough super quick beds. So they were onto something already on the on the on the uh, in the 70s. And the question for me is shouldn't uh, architects now return uh, uh, to this question now that the that the theme is so much uh, 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 in happening in our time. So meanwhile of course the, the city has started to redesign itself mostly without architects. Yeah, and in today's somehow attention deficit disorder society, we have discovered that we work better in, in short burst uh, puncture by rest. So today many companies are providing this kind of a sleeping uh, pods in, in offices to maximize uh, uh, productivity, like uh, Metronaps, like this one. And you can see they are very inspired actually <laughs> by the ones of uh, Archigram, right? Eh? Uh, uh, or, or, or not only in um, in offices, but sometimes uh, in airports, uh, etc. Uh, as Ariana Huffington uh, predicts, recharging in rooms would be as common as for rooms. You know, she's very much into sleeping being very important. But these uh, spaces, these relaxation spaces and technologies, are not simply appearing inside offices. They are also appearing, they are entire new typologies of buildings dedicated to sleep. There are new kinds of hotels in New York and in many other cities where you can just check in for a nap, right? I mean, at least before the, the, the pandemic, this was very popular, not only with people in offices that could, you know, instead of going for, for lunch, we could use the 30 minutes and, or, or one hour that you have and go into these spots and have your lunch and you can have your and put your iPods and listen to music and relax, right? Or you're a tourist and of course the tourist being a tourist is really hard work. And they were checking in into these hotels so whole new typologies uh, are emerging or were definitely very successful uh, before uh, uh, COVID. So in fact, you can argue then that the question of the bed is an urban question. One of the urban questions that should fall for our attention uh, today. So uh, in, in conclusion, the internet and social media have fundamentally uh, redefined the spaces in which we live for our relationship uh, to objects and to each other. Social media, you can say, is a new form of urbanization, the architecture of how we live uh, together. And, and beds have become the keynotes in this vast invisible net of global communication systems that define the real cities of today. And the COVID virus, which I started with, has only made visible this new architecture of the bed uh, that was already uh, here and that we, as architects, foolishly ignoring. Architecture has always had an intimate relationship with disease and pathologies, even psychopathologies, as I have developed in my last book, the X-ray architecture and the exhibition sick architecture that is now at Thiba in Brussels. And this is another example of this, but not necessarily direct. Just as with the body, one illness can actually reveal another one. The COVID pandemic reveals pre-existing conditions, and the architectural response might be to these conditions rather than to the virus uh, itself. Of course, you may think about the fact that uh, artists and, and, and uh, writers have worked in bed since the turn of the century. You can think about Bruce, who always wrote in bed, or Matisse, who worked in bed, or Mark Ryan, or even Bruno Pebby being interviewed here in bed <laughs> in the 60s in television in, in Italy. So there are many examples before our time. Even Steve Jobs apparently presented his, um, <laughs> his one of these uh, iPads uh, 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 from uh, bed. But the point that I'm trying to, to, to think about is that working in bed today is different. Working in bed in the so-called gig economy is increasingly becoming a norm 
for a marginalized and disenfranchised uh, 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 and, and large group of, of people. It's no longer about the quasi aristocratic, the dandy, the creative uh, character, the male, usually, figure laboring in, in bed, but a shift in the organization of labor, perhaps in the, on the threshold of, uh, of what we would call post uh, uh, labor. The bed has become infrastructure, a crucial node floating in global uh, network. And then the question is, what is the architecture of this new space and time? What is the nature of this new interior in which we have collectively decided to check ourselves in? What is the architecture of this prison in which, in which night and day work and play are no longer differentiated and we are, by the way, permanently under surveillance, right? Even as we sleep in the so-called control uh, room new media turns all of us into inmates, even as we celebrate our interconnectivity, right? We are constantly being watched, even if I'm here relaxing and I'm booking a trip to, I don't know, to some place cool <laughs> in this kid, uh, I am producing data, right? I'm working and I'm being watched and, being, and my data is being, is being found, right? So this is also something to, to think about. New media turns all of us into inmates, even as we celebrate um, connectivity. So we have all become, in a way, contemporary recluses, as Hafner uh, put it a half a century ago. And to close with this example, in Laura uh, Poitras' uh, film Citizen Four, we saw Edward Snowden uh, close up uh, in close up for days uh, on end, sitting on his bed in, in a hotel in Hong Kong surrounded by his laptops, his uh, telephones, and, and communicating with journalists from all over the world about the secret world of massive global surveillance. So the biggest invasion in the history of privacy in the planet was revealed to us symptomatically from a bed and dominated all media. So the most public figure at that moment in the, in the world was a, a, a recluse. Right? In, in bed. Anyway, with this I finish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. I think uh, we'll all agree that was an amazing talk and we all kind of run through the bed. Uh, I'm going to invite Shumi both now to kind of converse with you in bed. Um, and then we'll, and we'll take some kind of uh, discussion from the audience at the same time as well. I wonder how much you could charge for this sort of intimacy. <laughs> oh, yeah. how, how much I can what? How much we could, either of us could charge for this kind of intimacy. Oh, yes, you know? yeah, we should charge more, right? <laughs> <laughs> because we are doing it in bed, right? <laughs> amazing. And we could only fan this right now. Um, no, a really, really amazingly stimulating lecture. I made like two pages of notes, even though I've seen also thinking about this issue alongside you know um i remember when tracy emmons bed won the turner prize and it was such a radical move for her at that time to display the intimacy of her bed she was very much displaying her sexual history and saying this is art you know the my radical intimacy is art and in contrast to what you were saying today where this radical intimacy has been forced upon us mm -hmm. i remember very clearly at sort of midway through 2020 i was begging my students to put their cameras on because i felt so distant from them and one of my students put their camera on and they were in bed with another one of my students which was more than a time <laughs> so as much as i was asking for that intimacy sometimes it was more than i I wanted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. But I, I'm really stuck somewhat with you on this notion of um, labor connected to the bed. Mm -hmm. I put all this paraphernalia. Um, all of the phones, the fact that we need a laptop or a phone definitely plugged in next to the bed, you can't wake up without it. And then, you know, you're working before you're in mm -hmm. almost again. I, don't believe you if you say that you're not even mentally working before you get up. Um, when I was doing some research with my um, 
colleagues Finn Williams and Jack Self for home economics, we learned that the bed had overtaken the couch as the most ubiquitous and most used piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. Because precisely because you can work and live in it. And at that time, we were going under a housing crisis, mm -hmm. uh, an economic housing crisis, due to the lack of investment in that um, in this country for decades. And so, what we were observing on, uh, you know, Gumtree or whatever um, room share websites was that places were becoming bedrooms that were not bedrooms, mm. corridors, sheds, dining rooms, clearly dining rooms with patio doors and then a bed in there. Mm -hmm. Because in this city, you can get a thousand pounds a month. Mm -hmm. And in, the, in an economic crisis, the bed becomes a way to generate income mm -hmm. within the home. So yeah, I'm really kind of uh, with you on this notion of the bed becoming a site of productive labor, and maybe it used to be the site of reproductive labor. Mm -hmm. And um, now those two lines are completely blurred. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm kind of just responding to things that you simulated on rather than questions. But I guess yeah. one is sort of with this ambiguity of what the bed is, what is the architect supposed to do? Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of um, Ayer's installation at Freeze. Time has lost all meaning, so I've forgotten what year it was. Um, but they simply, as their art piece, they simply installed a bed and several plug points from where you could charge your devices mm -hmm. and therefore do what you want. Mm -hmm. And I think this advent of access to technology because at the time you're describing in the at the end of the last century, it was becoming affordable in the new millennium, it became much more affordable for people to have high speed internet. Mm -hmm. Before that, there was the brief cafe culture, right? Where you mm -hmm. have to go to Starbucks and do stuff because the internet's better. But then as soon as we got relatively affordable cable internet at home, mm -hmm. there's no need to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, yes. yes, I mean, I think that's a a very, very important transformation and very, very significant of the role of, of the bed. In fact, the research I started to do in the bed uh, has the title, the, the Bed in the Age of Social Media, right? <laughs> because I think that uh, it was precisely this, uh, the accessibility of, of high uh, internet in the home and the significance of social media in our, our life was a very important factor. In the in the transformation of the of the space of the bed as a space of uh, of uh, communication, a space of connection with other people, etc. I'm totally with you that is uh, I'm I'm not in, in a way glamorizing this situation. I'm no, just no. saying it's happening. What do we want architects to do? I never want for prescribing anything. No, I'm, I'm always one for asking questions, and that's why I turn this. Into, into a question at the Venice Biennale, where I reconstructed, for those of you who don't know, in the Biennale of Venice, in the uh, uh, Dutch pavilion, which was dedicated to labor, I reconstructed the bed of, um, of uh, Yoko Ono and, 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 uh, and John Lennon, exactly the same bed with the same flowers and so on. And because, of course, because it's the Biennale, all the architects and all the architectural critics, but also some um, uh, art critics and, uh, and curators like Hans Ulrich Orbrich were all around, right? And I invited all to, to the bed. Mm -hmm. And I have a number of interviews, uh, maybe with 100 people in the space of the opening of the, of the Binale. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really incredible because uh, you uh, pose the question. And, and of course, there's always the architects that say, you know, I did a hotel in which I did this, you know, some <laughs> some want to sell their bed. And other ones, in, it became more engaging the philosophical question of what is the bed today. And Hans Ulrich, it was very fascinated by it, and he was the one that invited me to bring it to the Serpentine. And the interesting thing about the Serpentine, uh, here it was in the Frida Escobedo uh, uh, pavilion, it was that it was not just architects. So there were archivists and anthropologists and psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts like Mark Hans, I mean, like it was unbelievable people, right? And, uh, and, and some architects too, and artists, right? And, and so the whole question expanded because this is what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in the what is it in for? the dialogue. What's the bed for anymore? I think is a lot of what is being confused, like you know, discussed. Like on the one hand it is used as a site of production. 
Um, on the other hand, as you say, there is this sleep culture, even fetishization of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking very much about the contrast between, you know, if you read lifestyle publications, um, don't, but anyway, if you do, um, <laughs> you might find those people that we idolize on screens and in print as saying, oh, no, I can't function without eight hours of sleep. I need my sleep. I need my 10 hours of yeah, sleep. Yeah, what a luxury to be able to say this. Yeah. And on the other hand, in East London, we have people sleeping in shifts you know, mm -hmm. because you cannot use a room for mm -hmm. one tenant um, if you're working in shift work or in zero hour contract, um, highly casualized work. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I'm kind of used to in urban life in India where perhaps um, members of a village will pull together and rent a room. Mm -hmm rent a bedroom in the city. Mm -hmm. And then the boys from that village will go and stay in that bedroom. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the possibility of sleep mm -hmm. is tantamount to the possibility of survival. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, we have a sleep fetish. What's mm -hmm. your bedtime ritual? Mm -hmm. Do you face mask? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you double cleanse and all of this? Right. So right, right. <laughs> it's, um, it's sort of so, not only the labor of the bed, but the status of the bed is something that really fascinates me. And mm -hmm. I guess I'm not an architect, I'm also a historian, that's nice here. Um, but for architects to consider what the fuck is a bed for? What am I designing for? It could be my, my partner works in technology and particularly at the inter intersection between um, the sex industry and technology. Mm. So the bed, certainly after in person prostitution and solicitation became impossible due to the pandemic. The bed becomes the site of emancipation for mm -hmm. a lot of women mm -hmm. who didn't have the means of making money were it not for that intersection of sex and technology that allows you to do only fans or candle uh -huh. and stuff from the bed. Right. And in this sense, the possibility of having a bed or even renting a bed for a few hours becomes something so different to the place of rest, repose, mm -hmm. privacy, mm -hmm. and sleep. Right. And I'm, I'm with you, like I said, I'm not really sure of what my clear question is, but this polarization seems to be getting really extreme. Those of us who can afford to do certain things in bed, mm -hmm. and those of us yeah, for whom the bed affords the possibility of survival. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, in fact, if anything, uh, the COVID situation uh, made visible what we already knew, that uh, what was always there. But, uh, we have decided not to see, you know, when we say, oh, we can now work in bed, who can uh, or work at home? Who could work at home? I mean, millions of people could not work at home. I mean, many, many of us had the privilege of having jobs that, that allow us to teach from uh, our bed, so mm -hmm. from our apartments, right? And at the same time, you had uh, so many people uh, working in hospitals, in cleaning hospitals. Uh, you know, that were in the subway that was horrifying the space during the, the pandemic in, in New York and these people. So when we're talking about this, this question of the, of the bed as a site of, uh, of, of, of war right now, it's the same kind of uh, privilege that we were talking about the office uh, tower. It's Absolutely. not like everybody uh, is in an office tower from nine to five. There are also these people that start working at midnight because they're cleaning the office. Right, so there is always this uh, the, the 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 pandemic. If anyway, in, if if anything, made visible a lot of the inequalities mm. in the city. Right? Just imagining the new dinner party question of like, what do you do in your bed? And I work. I only sleep in my bed. It's a sanctuary. You know, I'm like basically already in these conversations. You are. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, 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 because a lot of, uh, of what you're saying, you know, Ariana Huffington was one of them, like exactly. uh, advocating that uh, sleep it, hygiene, yeah? Yeah, sleep hygiene, and, and that you don't do anything, mm -hmm. but you have the privilege of having a bed in which you can only do that. Well, you know, that's a lot because a lot of people have only one bed and in which they have to work, do their homework or whatever it is, and, and, and sleep mm -hmm. as well, right? And, and so this is. Uh, you know, in, in New York, they have to change the, the regulations, you know, because to, to make um, smaller apartments, because they, they, they couldn't be less than, I don't know what it was, 
uh, they have to be at least 300 square feet I and mean, they have to be small. So they became these, these apartments in which you basically come in and there is only one bed. And mm -hmm. there were all these, uh, this is before the What else do you need? It's the same yes. here. They're kind of micro pocket apartments. Micro apartments. Yeah. Where, where as long as there is this, um, you know, soft padded space mm -hmm. on which various things might happen, mm -hmm. it's worthy of of changing rent now optimistically maybe what would happen from the work life fusion mm -hmm. is that homes would be more generously designed because more shit is happening there mm -hmm. but i doubt that that is mm -hmm. um well certainly in this country it doesn't seem that that's possible the other thing that i sorry even the even the hotels are changed you know mm -hmm. it, it used to be the bed and there was always a desk and not the desk is progressively disappearing and i was also looking into all these so-called digitally and uh, digital nomads that go from place to place uh, uh, you know because now it's no longer you're not really attached to a place for for work or for most people and they go like surfing in i don't know in bali or then they go to florida or something and there's this new kind of hotels and i was looking at the rooms and i was very fascinated by the fact that there's no desk so there is a bed and the majority of people uh, that are moving around different parts of the world working in this uh, in this new economy um they just prefer to work there or then if they are uh, a, a socializing with other people they want to be in the kitchen with other uh, characters so i think what we expect from each other and where we expect to encounter each other is like massively different massively rather. different yeah and in terms of the nomadic bed, which you showed some examples of the sort of occasional bed, let's say, that you see in the airport nowadays or something like that. Mm. I remember when I was studying, seeing the super studio and a slightly different um, critique when I mean, it's super studio, and you see a sort of idea of a nomadic bed or, or the possibility of sleeping anywhere. Mm. I sort of saw it as a vaguely colonizing thing like, mm -hmm. as long as i've got my bed i can kind of take over your land and mm -hmm. extract from it what i need and carry my existence on the back of me so mm -hmm. i wonder if that's that's somehow like chiming with what you're saying about the way people are moving around the world in and out of cultures in and out of experiences mm -hmm. in and out of bed yeah in and out of bed <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm i'm imagining very easily short stories of um, romances that form between people who use beds in consecutively on the phone with the phone of somebody who left it in this communal bed or <laughs> yeah. I found someone's lots of shorts and now it's like a Cinderella. Or, you know, yeah. um, I can imagine new forms of intimacy and yet, as you mentioned, I am um, somehow nostalgic or, or concerned that some people will have the privilege to use beds in the way that I knew and I remember as a child and other people simply will not have that mm. advantage and I don't know if I'm being nostalgic or you know to imagine that there was such a space that was just for privacy and repose mm. and if I just need to accept that spaces for privacy maybe or what what's left I don't know um, the thing is that the question of uh, privacy, I mean, I, I, I'm totally with you in the question of class and the, and the question of whether a lot of people are excluded from, from, from uh, even this new economy of, uh, that allows you to work in that, right? But in, in terms of the question of privacy, it's very important to understand that the notion of what is private has been changing for all of humanity, right? And what we consider private now is not about what we, you know, imagine thinking about Robin Evans, for example, fantastic article that he wrote on figures, dogs, and processes, right? Where he described the invention of the corridor, right? And the separation uh, between rooms and how in the Renaissance you will go from one room and you will pass to another room where some people were sleeping or defecating or making love and nobody felt that their privacy was being invaded. Yeah. So it's a different notion of, of privacy. And likewise, uh, until very recently, in fact, you still have in the, uh, still in the post-war years in, in women's magazine, you have articles trying to convince the public that it's more hygienic to have one bed for each child. 
Okay, so we are talking about mid 20th century in places like the United States and Europe, there was still not clear that a kid had to have their own, their, mm -hmm. own, their own bed. So the notion of what is private and the notion of the, of the you know, That's this true. is a constantly evolving. And of course, you know, I like always talk with young people about this question, right? And so when you, when I started with this question of the bed, I started asking, what you know, the friends of my, my daughter and the friends of my daughter, you work in bed? Of course I work in bed. What, what, what are you supposed to be? You look in bed, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, you know. So, and, and, uh, and when you raise questions of privacy, they have a different notion of, of privacy. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Perhaps a slightly deluded one, but that's only from my, I don't know, approaching mm -hmm. middle age viewpoint <laughs> um, but I'm thinking of now you mention it I'm thinking of um you know pre-revolution French royalty if you if any of you watched Versailles or anything like mm. that where matters of state were conducted in the bed and it was sure. an act of power to stay in bed yes. so I can't remember the actress who plays you know I don't get out of bed unless it's x thousand dollars or what have you mm. but the fact that a king who is obviously an authority mm will have members of state kind of make important decisions at this site and there's a privilege to approach this site. So, right, right. I think that since you can say the, the Hefner bed is a kind of king's bed. I mean, you come to me, so mm -hmm. Tom Wall wants to interview to Hefner and it's, it's a sign of his power yeah. to say you have to come into the mansion and then you have to come into my bed, basically. Well, <laughs> okay. but we weren't okay with it in this country when many times last year there were politicians being, you know, on the news and they were talking from their home mm -hmm. and you could see their bed hopefully made i mean there were some politicians who would pose <laughs> with a very conspicuous bookshelf behind them but the ones <laughs> who were trying to be genuine would pose in their bedroom yes. and the public had a hard time just uh, digesting yeah. that here i think some of us thought oh well you know they're people too and the rest of the public were like this is not appropriate for you know i can't trust this person because i can see their yeah. laundry yeah, yeah, maybe we should. But they're also women, you know. They were giving birth in public. I mean, they, yeah. they, they, you know, a lot of people in this uh, royal birth, but also in the common First, I mean, it was uh, to have a village around you where you are giving birth. That was common. Actually. So again, this not in sort of privacy and the bed have uh, changed, continue to change, continue to evolve, right? And, uh, I think that's. Uh, so what do we want from marketers? You were asking. I don't know. I think. Maybe be attentive to what is happening in the culture, more attentive. I mean, sometimes I feel like, you know, why it could in the 60s, this group of people be so tuned into the fact that we maybe were approaching the end of, uh, of labor as we knew in and thinking about the role of the bed and make how, when it's upon us, you know, we have become like completely. Uh, yeah, the question is like when we're not doing even those forms of labor that we're doing online, mm -hmm. then what are we going to do with that? We are um, always working, even if you are not doing this form of labor. Yeah, it's true. That look at that. As you, you say, know, we'll like just be sending data. Yeah, we are sending data. We are, we are constantly sending. We are sending data where we are. We are sending, you know, when we walk on the street, we have become unable to read our city the way we were. Unless we put Google Maps or something, we are sending uh, information of where we are moving. We are, uh, you know, workers in, in some uh, uh, data uh, factory. I mean, we are producing this data in exchange for accessibility to uh, access to, to, to information. And the bed is one of the sites of such uh, uh, products, it's like a factory. I mean, well, obviously we're not done with this journey yet, but we have a lot of students in the room or younger people, it seems. So like, maybe we should hear what you guys are all doing in Perth so and we can ask that without getting fired. Uh, <laughs> we can ask if you have any questions. That would be nice. Yeah, please. It would be great. Yeah. Hi. So, I really, uh, really, really interesting but it's not really, well, it's a bit of a question, but it's also something that you have um, addressed. Have you thought about um, the site of the better space of uh, just like imprisonment? Mm -hmm. Like just how, for example, in like, so Charlotte Perkins wrote the yellow wallpaper, and at that time, you know, women were, you know, they they seemed deluded after they were given birth, they would be like taken by the husbands and just, you know, given the rest the, yeah, yeah, exactly, the idea of confinement, exactly, the idea of like the bed being a space of liberation and all the time, but actually, 
like even when you're in in isolation and imprisonment, the room transforms just psychologically. So um, yeah, just wondering. Yeah, no, I, you're, you're right. You didn't address that kind of. I mean, there's so much to talk about. That's right. why like, there's so much you can go on. Right, right. But the space of, of reclusion is very much uh, uh, there. I mean, even in Hefner, when he's a contemporary mm. recluse, right? so he alludes to this uh, to this fact that the the, the bedroom is itself a prison, right? The bed is it's kind of a prison. But uh, yeah. But in fact, it's, uh, it's an in, for many people, it's an involuntary uh, uh, prison. No? It's not a voluntary, it's a kitchen. It's, it's a voluntary recluse. But in the case of women, as you were talking about, uh, just like a deception, like chain. Wow, your disease. That's nice. a storm coming. A storm. A breeze. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it makes, it reminds me of my nephew, who's about two. So he can't sleep in a bed on his own yet. He has to put him in a cot with raised things, obviously, and he hates it. Yeah. He hates being yeah. put in isolation yeah. away from everybody else. And you know, like most other toddlers, yeah. it's the sort of <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the in involuntary confinement. Actually, the sort of what you're talking about specifically, um, the removal of the problematic woman. <laughs> um, that makes me think of what you were mentioning earlier, this crossover between the safety of the domestic and the medicalization of the scientific mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sort of space that the bed becomes, like you're confined to your deathbed or we know best, so stay in bed. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that aspect we haven't really... Yeah, the quarantine is based on. Yeah. Think about how many people were confined to their to their beds because they were sick or because they had been exposed or, or because yeah. in the early days uh, we were asked to assume that we were sick. I, I don't know what happened here, but I, I, that was shocking to, to be told that you have to assume that you're sick and and then uh, stay in your bedroom and stay in your that All New Yorkers were asked to do that. And, I also remember speaking to some of my students, as you mentioned this, um, who dealt with mental health issues over the last couple of years and before. Mm. And, you know, students would be like, I can't get out of bed. Mm. I just can't get out of bed. Mm. And some days the comment would be like, OK, you can get out of bed. What can't you do from bed? You're talking to me from bed, aren't you? OK. And so this kind uh. of trying to transform it from a space of confinement to a space of possibility was just trying to do that, you can't really you can just be with someone. And again, it's what you're doing in the bed that transforms what it is for you, isn't it? So yeah. how do you decide for that? Yeah, I'm gonna... Thank you. Thank you. Um, I finished that. Hi. <laughs> um, first question, slide of an icebreaker. How long do you guys spend in bed, like on average? How long do we spend in bed? Yeah, yeah. like individually. Yeah, I don't work in the. If that's what you if you are asking, I mean. No, I mean with combined sleep or whatever. Like, yeah. how long do you think per day you spend in bed? Every day. Yeah. Yeah, it varies. It varies. It depends a lot on what is happening. Yeah, whether you're traveling, if you're in a hotel, and what is space is this in a hotel? So, if, for example, if I am in a hotel room, in a, you know, I travel a lot for 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 all kinds of reasons, right? Yeah. And then I spend a lot more time in, in bed than when I am in, in, in my home. A lot of people, because I work on this thing that I work in bed, I don't. But I know lots of people that have written all their words on the horizontal. And I completely understand the connection, the, the connections with the unconscious, the fact that you may have better ideas actually on the horizontal. And just as you are relaxing, and the same with that when you're almost falling asleep, you may, you may have uh, experienced this all of a sudden, something that you've been working earnestly the whole day and you couldn't figure it out and just when you're falling asleep you know that's why a lot of writers have a notebook near their their bed yeah. but on average i would say eight hours um, if i am at home i don't know i i 
I, I'm trying to work out what to say without giving away too much. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite reluctant to go to bed. I don't know why, because every time I go to bed, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is fantastic. And the minute that I put my head down, it's like, okay, I, I'm allowed to relax now. Until then, I'm not. So for me, I guess the bed is still very much a space. So not only relaxation, but freedom. Recently, um, I've started going to... I'm very privileged to have the luxury of another bed to go to. So I'm going to the other bed because my partner snores. And <laughs> the other bed is like a holiday. <laughs> so I read books, I'll like go and get a drink and I'll yeah. like have a special fun time in the bed in my own. Um, but so so bed has become something else. Like I usually go to bed very, very late and think why I would go to bed so late. It's a time that I don't allow myself very easily maybe that's it so because i've associated bed with private time for me to enjoy i just don't get there until really really late and then i'm like oh why did i come to bed at 11. because for me i hate the bed right? you hate like, the bed for me i either go you're just young super tired <laughs> you don't want to go when you're sure you like, yeah you know either when i'm super tired or i'm ill right that's you need, um, otherwise you're done right otherwise i do but only when i'm like yeah. kind of dead for my entire day because again like coming back to Shima's point about back in India because I was in COVID during India because mm -hmm. summer was a privilege kind of being in bed and being able to work which I think comes a lot with being able to use technology and knowing how to use certain yeah. technology yeah. but for the rest who kind of I was dealing with every day whether they're bricklayers or painters you know they were dying to get out of bed exactly. but still for the kind of privilege to you how do you think the bed like as you said, the architecture needs to like change of the bed. Is do you mean the actual structure of the bed? You know, yeah. maybe like how yeah. it's designed. If maybe... we are spending so much time in bed, if we are working in bed, or if a huge amount of the population is working in bed, then we, as architects, need need to rethink what the bed is, right? Uh, how it is, uh, how we organize it, how you know, because well, obviously this doesn't work very well if you are if you are if you are working, right? I mean, you, if you are if you if you are uh, working and you are eating and you have your laptop and so on, so, so you start thinking about the basics. <laughs> and a lot of architects and designers have aspired to do this, but I guess I was addressing the more uh, uh, the bigger uh, question of um, what are we doing uh, in with our cities. I mean, yeah, is. If uh, industrialization brought with it, and that's why I brought this uh, this issue, uh, the separation, the radical separation between the place of work and the place of uh, of living, whether the place of work is a factory or is a, a, an office, and we have now these cities, which basically are cities of uh, of business and power, but now they are at best half empty, if not three quarters uh, empty, and we have a huge uh, uh, problem. Of of, uh, of housing, then I mean I think that should be really at the forefront of our of our preoccupations in, in the school. What is the city of our times? But I wouldn't even say the city of tomorrow because it's not the city of tomorrow. It's the city of today. Right now, yeah. Of right now, I mean, how do you rehabilitate office buildings for housing? How do you rethink the the urban space in in this situation, or well, even the uh, the space? Uh, of the territory. I mean, when so many people are no longer tied to um, to the workspace, uh, you know, all the, the written um, uh, research seems to indicate that people do not want to come back under any circumstances to the five days a week workplace. I mean, even three days a week seems like an incredible ordeal. And companies are coming to deal with who is this. Shouldn't we be thinking also from the point of view of architecture and urban uh, uh, planning? How, how what is that city mean? I mean, at the turn of the century, all this and all these moments with big transformations in the economy, architects were on the case of what is happening and, and what and providing uh, uh, images and, and and ideas that they were wrong or not. No? And, and sometimes I think that um, that we are not doing this uh, enough. You know, I mean, it's still schools of architecture that will uh, 
put as a project an office building like what <laughs> what, what is that <laughs> it's, it's very really possible you know without thinking about what is an office today or whether people are actually going to an office or i guess that's heck. what makes it a funny dream but in the instances where i've seen that i have seen students working in sleep rooms and restrooms and you get a sort of um slightly obsolete now i think mm -hmm. google campus mentality where you know you're trying to be kept and so but i take your point i'm sorry i didn't answer exactly how i missed it but basically when i allow myself to go to bed about 45 minutes before i have to do something that's as long as it takes for me to have a shower and a cup of tea so that long mm -hmm. it varies um but um in terms of the shape of the city uh it's interesting you said that thing about children having their own bedrooms in the COVID crisis, one thing that I another thing that I noticed is that children staying at home mm. mess people's lives up. Those people who have children. I don't have children, but people who are trying to work from home, mm -hmm. whether it's a bed or anything else, obviously they had childcare duties and made me think that the nuclear family, the single family home, mm. and the way we use bedrooms. It, it's not how I grew up. I grew up in joint families where I was raised and parented by aunts and uncles and domestic servants and lots of lots of different people. So the idea that a nuclear family has to comprise a certain number of bedrooms and be enclosed, it didn't work for us. A lot of people struggled. Yeah. And I was thinking that if we had grown up in a slightly more rhizomatic way or if we had families that existed in a slightly rise these these issues could be shared where people sleep mm -hmm. how people are managing their space and life right. but we haven't set our cities up like that right. we've set them up with individual homes and residential areas with a school and then work over here so mm -hmm. precisely as we were saying mm -hmm. i was just thinking about it from the shape of the family well yeah totally i mean COVID has also made us rethink what uh, the domestic space is. Uh, that means always not the space of the bed. Uh, what is the house? If work is to happen inside the house, whether it's in the bed or in another space inside in, in the house, what is the house uh, to be if the, uh, children are spending more time there because it's full, as Bucky Fuller already predicted uh, <laughs> many years uh, ago, uh, will happen online, uh, increasingly sure. online. I mean, we, we cannot imagine that this was just uh, something that happened because of the pandemic now that they know how to do it i mean it's, it's, it's bound to happen for for many reasons like it's a snow day today. before you see the snow day and now it will be like the zoom uh, uh class day no i mean i can imagine right? and so um uh yeah i agree with you about the nuclear family but i don't know that architects have so much uh, influence in that as more so society no, I uh, guess, questions. Right? right, here we're dealing with the legacy of architecture that has been built for a particular shape of yes. family. Yeah. And now we have to work out how to live equitably in it where mm. you know a lot of labor is being repeated from nuclear family to nuclear family and resources are not being used. Um right. but anyway, sorry, we're chatting. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, these are the questions. Yes, yes. So, um, it perhaps relates to what you were just saying, but I mean, you see this kind of blurring uh, between what was the oikos and what was the polis, and now we come back to this question where, let's say, both the, is there then something to say also about the blurring between the two gender roles themselves? So, you know, the man who was originally the bread earner of the family and he would go out and he would work, and the woman would stay at home and she would look after the kids, mm -hmm. but now. Uh, and that changed just slightly, you know, with the coming of the washing machine and those kinds of electronic devices. And, and that also changed the nature of the kitchen themselves in the 70s and the mm -hmm. feminist movement and all of that. So then today with the bed, does it also have something to shift uh, in terms of the power dynamics between the two genders themselves as both of them are now at home. And so, you know, responsibilities of who does what and who is the breadwinner constantly yeah. shift. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, those are uh, very, very relevant questions. Besides, uh, the idea of the of the two parents with two with uh, with two kids i mean it's non-existent any, anymore i mean a lot of the housing is uh, conforming to an outdated again uh, idea there are all kinds of arrangements uh, uh, a lot of uh, single people a lot of uh, uh, non-conforming uh, 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 relationships i mean yeah. it's, it's, no. it's a lot of creative families i mean i hope to be in that situation myself yeah. I've lost both of them. Yeah. 
structures, uh, you know, responsible for all the uh, psychoanalysis uh, uh, <laughs> that we have, right? I mean, all the, well, anyway. So okay. yes, of course. So this is also part of the of the of the, of the situation, right? That what used to be uh, considered a family is already disintegrated for the most part and is uh, um, uh, evolved into into different kinds of uh, arrangement, including perhaps a return to a more multi-generational. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think so. I um, mean, with COVID, a lot of people have uh, experimented with all, all kinds of things. Between COVID and the pressing economy, which makes it harder for younger people to get, let's say, independence in terms of the domestic realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we are seeing a much more mm -hmm. multi-generational thing. Mm -hmm. I also think, um, sorry, I keep coming back to this point, I sound really smutty, but it's not to do, well, I'm thinking, yes, there will be gender roles, but also it wasn't that long ago that husbands and wives weren't applied to share a space. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. you'll know better than me, but a 20th century phenomenon where the bedroom is the second place uh, where, you know, the husband and wife have their comfortable mm -hmm. relationship. I, you know, if you read the novels, but mm -hmm. the 19th century, there's always different chambers yeah. and different spaces in which the genders interact. And that may not be the bedroom anymore, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's written. I mean, on all of laws, all these architects of the 20th century, they have different space for uh, this, you know, for women and for, uh, for men and other spaces of encounter, right? Mm -hmm. and it's privilege again, because you need to have all those spaces. Like you would say, it's a privilege yeah. to have another bed. It's like to have another bed. You can take sure. a vacation and another bed for so many things. So to that end, sex just becomes another act of production itself. Well, I don't know about that. That's <laughs> going to be personally negotiated, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and, you know, good luck to the people who have to do that. But, um, but no, I just, I wonder if sex might be something that, or rather, mm. what is considered sexual might not take place in the prescribed places mm -hmm. that we decided they ought to. <laughs> right. So much sex takes place actually on the phone. I mean, you know, I mean, so much uh, uh, sex takes place now in another in another yes. space or with the aid of other spaces. Or you yeah. know, uh, it's not uh, tied to a physical location in the same way. Think about the last time you heard of someone breaking up because they cheated on each other and said it was because they saw something on social media on their phone or something. Mm -hmm. They didn't walk into the bedroom like in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. yes. I have a kind of question a little bit about this idea of prescribed spaces for things and I feel like we're kind of losing spaces for rest, mm -hmm. for real rest and whereas maybe the bed or the bedroom at some point would have, would have been that space and now even the very act of sleep is infiltrated mm -hmm. by, you know, we look at these pods, that kind of snack pods, mm -hmm. they're designed to make you more productive. Mm -hmm. So you're resting, but you're really resting. Mm -hmm. um, and equally, we're using apps to help us sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like we don't have a space for real rest anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. And this idea of sort of like rest as resistance, um, mm -hmm. there was like, I think there's a movement called the Nap Ministry, which kind of encourages sleep. <laughs> Um, and just taking naps essentially, yeah. not to be more productive, but just actually as, as a form of self care. And I'm also thinking about, you know, writers like Audrey Lord, who were talking about self care as kind of warfare, mm -hmm. this like need to kind of rest in, it, in order to be able to kind of resist and continue some kind of mm -hmm. activism or protest. Or, yes. um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments. Yeah, it's like the revenge of the Spaniards. They always say the Spaniards were lazy because they are always taking naps. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love taking naps myself. And now it's the revenge of the of the of the of the nap, the nap because we Absolutely. always got this as part of our culture. And now, of course, uh, uh, our first industry discovered that uh, actually you were more productive mm -hmm. when you have a little 
and now, but then there is also now in the whole new new movement of the taking care of yourself and having an app as a, as a you know as a way to take care of yourself. I totally, I totally agree. I don't I don't know that the bed uh, in this uh, nuclear family model that uh, we were talking about was such a place of uh, of rest. I mean, the invention of the eight hours. Uh, shift and the invention of the eight hours sleep it has all to do with productivity but not uh, an invention for, and for, consumption for, right and you for pleasure you need, for to, pleasure. you need to sleep so that you can work and buy and buy exactly and be a productive member of the community so <laughs> i don't know when you when you go back to the turn of the century interiors and you see all these boudoirs of the corbusier and all these spaces you know those well, seem to me a spaces for pleasure yeah right? all this women's room of of out of laws and all this okay, well these guys will still got it right you know and and uh, it's in the 20th century in the I 20s and 30s still. i think um what we're doing culturally is so different from what we're doing biologically or what's mm -hmm. happening with us biologically let's come to figure it out at some point because you know, scientifically, as animals, we need sleep. It's damaging to us if we don't sleep, and, and all of this mm -hmm. that we're now able to learn more about in kind of more and more terrifying detail. But culturally, I don't know. I, I was having this, I'm being very intimate. I think it's because I am in bed. Yes. I was having this conversation with my therapist today, also from bed, and I was suggesting to him that I don't work hard enough. Like, I don't know when the last time was that I labored physically to the point that I thought I deserved my bed, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm just wondering if our attitudes towards work and leisure and rest are also maybe changing. Mm -hmm. If what we want to do is keep consuming, keep moving, keep producing, mm -hmm. then possibly there are, there is a cultural desire to sleep differently. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, it's an economic pressure that, you know, you must give up this idea of four hours continuous sleep, what you get at your social status is eight half hour naps, mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, obviously, I think there's a breaking point between the cultural and the biological, and mm -hmm. we'll see them at the edges, but um, I don't feel that I, you know, when my boyfriend often tells me sleep you know you need to go to sleep you're not superhuman you need to go to sleep it's four o'clock in the morning you've got an eight point nine go to sleep um and i often think that you know i'm not tired because i haven't done anything i've just been sat in front of my laptop what sleep do i need mm. um, i'm here like this when i'm asleep and i'm like this when i'm awake what <laughs> <laughs> so i think there's this kind of emotional labor and kind of physical labor yeah i think all like, of Mm. Precisely. I think the, the bodily labor and even the mental labor mm -hmm. doesn't match up to what I culturally think of as productive. Mm -hmm. And that messes up my ability to see the bed as. Mm. I mean, but maybe it's important to remember that the eight hours sleep um, uh, is an artificial idea that we can use to sleep that way at all until the industrial uh, revolution that they force upon us with the idea of the schedule in the eight hours. And actually, before uh, people were not sleeping away at all, they will, you know, sleep for a couple of hours and then make love and eat, or I don't know, be with a candle or something like that, and then go back to sleep again and do all kinds of things uh, uh, at night, because it was a long night to, for electricity, right? Particularly in the, in, in the winter, in which a lot of things happen, but what never happened. Is the eight hours. The eight hours is complete, was completely impossible because a lot of problems to people, and we're still paying for, for this. We haven't adapted as human beings to the, <laughs> we haven't had time to adapt as, uh, as a species to the eight hours. That's why we have so many, for, many problems. Not that's why so many people have to, to, be, to, to take pills and everything to achieve yeah. this completely artificial and irrational idea of the eight hours that is simply. They are to to facilitate the the eight hours of work and the and the and the working. Uh, no, completely. And this is the kind of tiny positive discovery that we have from, I guess, the recent situation and the gig economy that people have been mm -hmm. left the freedom to do what they can where they want. Right. 
or, or another prison because sometimes people are working, you know, uh, are, are getting up at, at whatever time because they are working with uh, in China or they are working, you know, wherever in, in Asia in a different time zone basically. And that's one of the reasons why also people are working in bed because they work, they sleep for a few hours and then they wake up and do something. We are making time not to stop <laughs> speaking about the schedule. Yeah, one more question at the back to me. Let's take it yeah. and I'm looking at you. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I, I, I was um, in this afternoon. Um, um, I was just thinking about the Hugh Hefner and the Bachelor. Mm -hmm. And it was very curious to me a few years ago, actually after after you did the the, the serpentine pavilion, mm -hmm. I thought we never talk about the bachelorette, and I know that's not really a word, but I refuse to use spinster. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 you refuse like, to use what? spinster, the one you put it in. But oh, we never talk about the bachelorette. bachelorette. Yeah. Had. And I was at that time I was thinking about the only one I could think of was Sex and the City. Mm -hmm. and I'm just thinking of the four beds of the four women uh -huh. and how they were very like reflective of their personality. Uh -huh. Yes, just in terms of the, where they were located in the house. Like uh -huh. Carrie Bradshaw's bed was like right next to the entrance. It's kind of like uh -huh. a little bit of sense. And then you know you had, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. and then you had, uh, you know the the the, the prudish one. I forget her name. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I was inside the right at the end of the house and we could never get to it. And then we had you know Miranda, which had two sideboards with proper like lamps. And the uh -huh. was very soft. Like, oh. just, I mean I couldn't have but like I, I remember that at that time thinking, but we never talked about where that that you know obviously that women who are not married, it's just like really fantastic. Married. Yeah, thank you so much for, for this uh, suggestion. I'm actually thinking about this as we speak because a colleague from um, uh, Latin America, from Sao Paulo, Jose Lira, uh, is coming to visit us first and he suggested that we teach together and say, okay, and I thought he was going to suggest that we would teach about Latin America, modern architecture in Latin America. Yeah, that's great. I'm very interested in, in this and I have thought before and he says, no, actually, I want to do the bachelor house, and I said, "Oh, that's that's, that's interesting." But then, of course, it triggered, and I was thinking, "Oh, of course, I can think about all the ways in which I could bring the whole history of modern architecture, because it's not just um, a hair plan. If you think about about it, the whole history of modern architecture is full of bachelor houses. You know, from the Corbusier to Spinoza Pavilion, who is that? It should be today. That's for this cultivated man that collects us and cultivated man. You know, a lot of love who also talks about the cultivated, they are all these cultivated man. Mies also has the bachelor house in, in the exhibition in, in Berlin. There is all these bachelor houses in the history of architecture, you cannot avoid it. But there is also, and let's much less talk about bachelorettes. Houses. If you think about Edith Farnsworth, the famous um, client of, uh, of the Farnsworth uh, house, it was a very a complex uh, doctor in Chicago who had commissioned me to do this um, this uh, weekend house uh, yeah. uh, for her, and, and it all turned into a nightmare. But anyway, the point is because they they fought, or they, you know, they, they sue each other and all of this. But the thing is that that's a, a bachelorette uh, if you want uh, a, a house, and not in the sense of the spinster at all, even if the his, historians of architecture have treated her in that way. Yeah. I remember Alan Kukun saying, oh yeah, she is so angry with me because she was rejected by me, and it's like this picture. Yeah, obviously, that's the only reason why she Yeah, it. exactly. But um, then you can think about Eileen Gray, you can think about all these fantastic. Or even the Josephine Baker house that was yeah. like a, a weird little unbuilt treasure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess what I'm thinking is that the bedroom and possibly formerly the kitchen are places where women are expected to perform, right? Mm. And I guess. The Sex in the City bedrooms, especially hearing you lay it out like that, they are all performing some aspect of the identity of the characters, right? Yeah. The sucky one, the prudish one, whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah, I guess this, I, I don't know, do you do it? I'm interested to know, now I'm interested to go back to my bedroom and see what I'm performing by the way that I've arranged it. Because right? mm -hmm. um, I guess we all are. But, but no, thanks for the point I had. Yeah, thank you for, for this. I mean, it was very interesting the way you were reading the sex uh, 
in the city. But I was just trying to make the point that if you think that in the history of architecture that is irrelevant, it's because we haven't looked close enough. Mm -hmm. Because they are there. They are there and they are very interesting. Think about that bed of five in gray in the middle of the E27 uh, with this invitation to Voyage, etc. I mean, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that one could, could think about that we don't think about. Because yeah. we neglect this, this aspect. So. Yeah, and of course, in, there are other cultures to borrow from. And thinking about the Zenana in the Southeast Asian mm. culture, the half of the house where women would be. Mm. And yes, that is also falls under the category of confinement in one hand, but there are specific spatial arrangements in the Zenana for the life of women mm. that is worth looking at. It just hasn't been, so let's do that one day. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think it was a great point to kind of finish on actually. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you both for a really great discussion and for being so kind of open. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. And thanks to everyone else for kind of braving the crazy heat wave and for coming over here. I feel um, closer to you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah.